Okay, good morning. I'm Burkenna, the Orange Chamber of Commerce's Vice Chair of Events. I'm excited to welcome you to the February installment of Eggs and Issues. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping reminders, and I have those here with me on my screen. If you're here with us on Zoom, please make sure that your audio is muted and your video is off. This is going to be an open format and questions are encouraged. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please use the chat function in your Zoom toolbar or if you're with us here on Facebook Live, please go ahead and type those comments in the chat in the video section on Facebook Live. We have moderators on both platforms and we'll do our best to answer any questions you have. And with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce this morning's guest speaker, Orange County Supervisor Don Wagner. Supervisor Donald P. Wagner represents nearly 600,000 residents in the thriving communities of Orange County's third district, which include Anaheim Hills, Irvine, Orange, Tustin, Villa Park, Yorba Linda, and the unincorporated Canyon. He is a proud Bruin, devout Catholic, practicing, former, practicing attorney, former community college district trustee, six-year state legislator, and past mayor of Irvine from the late 2016 time period through 2019. Don's 20 years in public service reflects an impressive commitment to fiscal responsibility, public safety, educational excellence, and economic growth. Don and his wife are longtime residents of Orange County where they raised and educated their three children. So for the second time with us here, Don's been here with us. He was with us in May, right when we were getting things started virtually. So the second time. So welcome again, Don, for your second time with us here on Eggs and Issues. I know you're busy. Thank you for joining us. Well, Brickhead, the pleasure's mine, and uh, it is the second time we've done this virtually. It's the third time I've done it, and last time I was, I was hoping it would be the very last virtual, and here we are almost a year later and still doing it this way, but uh, gosh, it's good to be at least uh, virtually out and about, so appreciate the chance to chat. Right, definitely, and I actually saw that you... Um... You were out, I think, this week, this week and last week, giving out some twenty thousand dollar grants. I thought we visited Mike Lyricos at our favorite Catella Grill, which is where we used to host our B and G. You were at the OC Rescue Mission, Youth, uh, was it Youth Centers of Orange. Mm -hmm. How were those visits? Were the you know were they receptive? Like were they? It seemed like the, everyone's so happy to see you. So tell us yeah. about those. How they go? Well, they're they're happy to see the um, support that they're getting, and uh, I was just the messenger, you know. That the, the joke, and there's some truth in it, is that, you know, as politicians, what we do best is give away other people's money. And that's what I was doing. The county has come up with funds to help our struggling nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And each of the departments has a, 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 each of the districts has an opportunity to distribute funds within that district to help the, uh, the nonprofits. And I did get a chance to get out to several, as you said, new centers of Orange County, um, the um, uh, Waste Not OC, a uh, number of different uh, venues, the Rescue Mission, uh, United Way, et cetera. With, with $20,000 grants, some of the, the bigger organizations, it doesn't go as far as it does for some of the smaller organizations, but I can assure you everybody is looking for any kind of help they can get Mm -hmm. uh, by now. Um, that was money geared to the nonprofits. We previously done arts grants and even before that managed to do grants to the um, um, struggling businesses throughout the third district. So um, it's a tough time, but we are doing what we can to help. Definitely. We thank you so much for that. If we could, I know a lot of people have asked about this and I'm going to probably kind of start here as well, is um, if you can give us an update on the COVID-19 vaccination process, that would be great. Okay. So, so that has been a frustration, a moving target, and I am happy to report there has been, just in the last couple of days, some progress. So, so let, me, let me kind of step back. The county has a app, an app called Othena, which I'm sure you've all heard about, mm -hmm. that is being used to process availability for the vaccine for several reasons. One is that there are parameters as to who can get the vaccine. And it's not simply as easy as showing up at say a pharmacy and getting the flu shot. Um, you've got to have a number of things kind of fall into place. You've got to be 
in the category of people that the state allows to get the vaccine, which right now is first responders, those that are 65 and up, and they recently just opened it up to educators and uh, grocery store workers, farm workers, um, um, child care providers, et cetera. But you've got to fit into the categories. Mm -hmm. And then again, it isn't just like getting a flu shot. It is until very recently um, a two shot regime. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the ability to follow up and get the second dose. You've got to be able to process who's gotten the first dose so that we can follow up and make sure the second dose is given. There needs to be a um, watch period, isn't long, but it's 15 to 20 minutes to make sure there are no adverse reactions. And so it's, it turns out to be a somewhat more complicated procedure than folks originally thought it might be meaning that we had a number of, of healthcare providers early on volunteer to be um, uh, on the front lines and dispensing the, the vaccines once they looked at all of the rules and requirements and, and what we were gonna hold them to at the county, right. they said, no thanks. So we ended up having fewer um, folks available for the, um, um, the vaccine. Then there's the complication added on top of it that we at the county are given 20% of the total doses that come to Orange County. The okay. healthcare providers, the hospitals, et cetera, get the other 80%. And so somehow we've got to integrate who's getting the vaccines in the hospitals, and that doesn't entirely get reported, who we're giving the vaccine to, who's eligible, who gets the second dose, that's a long way of saying the rollout has been anything but smooth. I am, I guess, able to take some comfort in saying, as I read the news from around the state, which is an old bad habit I have from my days in the legislature, Orange County is not alone in fighting those problems, but they are problems. We are fighting them and they have led to it, uh, enormous frustrations. Right. The, the good, the, the, the the other bad news, let me add just a, a smidgen more bad news before I get to the good news. And there is good news. <laughs> yes, I um, hope so. <laughs> and then last week, I'm sure you read throughout the state, but Orange County, no exception, we ended up missing deliveries of vaccines because they were held up by the bad weather back east. And so the distribution chains around the state ground to a halt because of bad weather through the Midwest and, and Texas, et cetera. And so deliveries were missed last two, Tuesday a week ago, and then Thursday a week ago, deliveries of Moderna in the first case, Pfizer in the second, were delayed. And so all of a sudden, everybody is even more frustrated. Um, but the good news is the deliveries have started to flow again and the single shot Johnson and Johnson vaccine is expected to come online within the next couple of weeks. Add to that, the federal government has decided that it is going to start making available when it has them shot uh, doses directly to the pharmacies, the CVSs, the Walmarts of the world, right. et cetera, Walgreens of the world, et cetera. And so we are expecting a substantial loosening of supplies in the very near future. Last quick point on distribution. Remember, there are the lists of who gets it. And just recently, the government, uh, the Sacramento system, um, opened up availability to educators, um, food workers, uh, grocery workers, childcare providers, uh, et cetera, and has directed that 70% of the vaccines go to the 65 plus, but that 30% of the 20% we get think we're not sure. Maybe it's the total 20% that Orange County gets. The rules are unclear. Uh, the 30% go to those uh, other categories which is going to, I am certain, frustrate our elderly who are most at risk right. while we are giving shots to folks who are 
much, much less at risk. Uh, nevertheless, that's the directive out of the state we are, we are gonna be forced to comply. Long answer, bottom line, we have a July 4 target date to get the whole county or those who want it vaccinated. Okay, we, that's not bad. we remain on track for that um, despite frustrations, which I share and, and some of these hiccups. Let me ask you this. Um, it, it sounds like such a tedious process and I have been following it um, on your site as well as some of the social media outlets um, that you guys have posted from your department. Have you guys seen that it's hard to get people to come in and get that second shot? Like, do we have, I guess, adequate follow-up to make sure that like people aren't just like, oh yep, got it, one well, done, I'm great, I'm out the door. <laughs> but I think that sometimes that happens, you know, it's kind of like the average person going to the doctor, like they give you, you leave with a lab paperwork and you may never get that done. Like you might just carry it around and find it a year later. Like, do we have a process in place through that app that people to make sure that people come back in? The, the answer is yes, um, okay. for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> Number one, we are trying very diligently to make sure we follow up. We don't give a first dose to anybody without scheduling the second dose and making sure that that person is aware of that date, has an opportunity to follow up. Um, so, so the answer right now is that that second dose hasn't been an issue. Um, the actual issue has been folks who were scheduled for second doses in the last couple of days when the supply chain was so impacted. The good news on that front is that that second dose has got a fairly large window. In the press, they've been reporting it, you know, within a couple of days, you've got to, of, of the, the, I guess it's a 30 day period, you got to get the second dose. The manufacturers are saying, no, you've got a month or so to get that second dose before okay. you've in effect wasted the first. So we aren't yet seeing that problem because we're trying to stay on top of it. And because right now, realize that we can't let anybody get the shot. Everybody who's getting the shot right now wants it. And so they are doing the things they need to do. It's, it's not like, as you say, Rekenda, the doctor says, here, go get your blood work. It's like, do I need my blood work? People want the shot, right. getting them right. So we aren't finding follow-up is, is an issue. One of the okay. advantages of Johnson & Johnson that should, as I say, become available in the next couple of weeks is that's a single shot. And um, uh, so the follow-up is disappear with that one. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that that's what's going on. And thank you so much for your work on that. I know it's I, said, I, I really realize that it's a tedious process. We see what's going on and all the help that you guys are providing in your department. So thank you for that. Let's talk business regulations. You know, we are here with the orange business community. What do you see going on as far as what business owners can expect as to where we are today compared to, you know, even where we were, I guess, in May, that was quite some time ago, but where are we headed and what, what are we doing right now? Well, I'll tell you where right now we are headed in the right direction in terms of the government, his um, uh, colored map scheme, um, we are in that the so-called red tier for several of our important metrics. We have been going in the right direction. Um, almost the entire calendar 2021, if not the whole calendar 2021, there may have been a couple of, of bobbles in there. But, but anyway, the, the, the trend is in the right direction. With the vaccine being spread uh, much, much wider, you know, obviously than we saw in January, for example, we are cautiously optimistic that we have turned the corner. Um, I will also tell you that the governor has been moving faster and farther on issues. Than, frankly, he said he would several months ago. Okay. Why? The cynic would say, because he's staring at a recall, the science is virtually unchanged since the governor's original uh, lockdown orders. And you look around the nation, um, and Florida is the obvious example, and it's the one the press keeps talking about. Um, on a per capita basis, Florida is in roughly the same shape, a couple of metrics better, than uh, California and is essentially wide open. California 
continues under the governor's system, though he has just this week signaled that he is going to perhaps loosen up some of the rules in the system that he made up. And so it's, it's genuinely, I believe, a moving target. The trend in the right direction. And it is my hope that it will not, that the trend not only will continue, but that the desire of the governor for whatever reasons to get us reopened and opened safely is something that is going to, um, to, to stay. The, the fact of the matter is, and the business owners on this call, I know, believe this, we can reopen safely. Okay. Wear a mask, wash your hands, do the social distancing. If you're a business and you want to enforce a mask, no mask, no service, the sheriff's told me he will respond to your call and he will help you enforce that. But let's get things reopened because the public won't come if they don't feel safe. The public wants to get out and start shopping, start dining, start doing those sorts of things. It is my hope, finally, to, to answer the question, <clears throat> that certain things we saw during corona, uh, uh, COVID shutdown mm -hmm. continue. Okay. And in particular, those are things like more outdoor dining. Lots of folks have spent a ton of money, for example, buying extra heaters and tents, et cetera. If there's anywhere on planet Earth that you can dine outdoors, it's Greece in the picture behind me and Southern California. <laughs> and it's right, it's right here. Um, we're seeing, and, and this is bad news, but we're seeing um, commercial centers find themselves struggling for tenants, has the inevitable effect of opening up some outdoor space and parking facilities, et cetera, to increase outdoor dining, increase some outdoor activities. That's something I hope um, uh, survives uh, COVID. But bottom line, Rakenda, we're moving in the right direction and, and I'm hopeful we can continue. Yes, I am as well. And you mentioned outdoor dining, which is, has become one of my favorites. You know, I live in a beach city, so I love to be outside. That's just something that, that's why I moved down here. <laughs> I love to be outside. And, you know, my second home is orange. We dine al fresco all the time. Like I could, I sometimes find myself not going to the downtown area because I just get lost in there. I just like to sit outside. My time just like is spent there in the glorious sun and it's amazing. And so I do, like you said, I hope that continues. I hope that, you know, we're able to within our city kind of make sure that we're able to do some sort of that, you know, all the time, as opposed to just stopping it when everything kind of goes back to whatever normal is going to look like. <laughs> well, I think the city council was, was great in terms of being very proactive on that and kind of set the tone because, you know, they closed mm -hmm. the cell or, or part of it around the plaza there and allow the restaurants and allow those businesses to come out into the sunshine, into the streets. It hasn't had a significant impact on, on traffic. Other cities followed suit. And I, I think, you know, I, I know we have the mayor on the call. I know he is able to um, um, take a look at this him, himself and his council very, very closely, but boy, isn't that a nice thing to see and maybe something that we would miss if it were to go away. Yes, we definitely would for sure. So let me ask you this, um, as far as the fiscal condition of our county, are we looking at cutting or reducing services or where are we at financially right now? Um, sadly, the answer is we probably are looking at, at cuts okay. in, in services. So far, we have been very tight uh, in terms of positions at the, at the at county employment, county, county staffing. Um, we are not filling positions um, particularly robustly at all. We're achieving savings there. Um, the, the, the bottom line is not only is every city in this state, but the counties as well are, are suffering through um, the, the shutdown. You see a hit to sales tax. You see just all sorts of, of slowing down of economic activity that inevitably hits cities and counties in the pocketbook. We are looking at a tougher budget. We had reserves at the county, have reserves at the county level. We have spent 
uh, uh, substantially into the reserves. Okay. Um, and, 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 and again, just not to get too far into the weeds, but when you kind of look at COVID and municipal and county budgets, you know, COVID hit in the last quarter of the 2019-2020 uh, budgets. Yeah. And so the hit was limited to that last quarter. And then you went into the 2021 budgets and you see it, the entire budget has been impacted by, by COVID. And of course, folks spent reserves, you know, early on to cover those, those first few months of shortfall. And so we end up finding ourselves in an entire fiscal year with diminished reserves, with some of the same fiscal challenges that COVID has been causing, which is a long-term prognosis for belt tightening and um, keeping just a, a real firm eye on municipal and county budgets. We are prioritizing obviously public safety, obviously um, uh, public health and the COVID response. We have gotten help from the federal government, which also like politicians everywhere just gives away other people's money. It is your money, it is my money. But right. through the federal government, we had um, um, some help. We are told if you read the papers, more is coming. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's it's going to be a tight budget for the next several years. Okay. What do you think? So to get us back to a strong position, like what would that take and what can businesses do to, I guess, move us in that direction or if we're even at that point yet of thinking about that? Well, what I would say most immediately is governor get us back open. We can open, we can open safely, but let's get the um, economic engine that um, formerly was our economy up and going again. Um, part of the problem with, of course, is that, you know, when you're looking at the federal government filling in or you're looking at the, the, the states or the counties or cities themselves, um, giving out grants, for example, to small businesses, which we, which we talked about a minute, nonprofits, well, Government just doesn't have enough money right. to prop up the entire economy. Um, I would argue we don't have it for the year that we've spent doing it. Um, the, the deficits, the, the red ink we're looking at is, is to my mind, um, quite scary. You've got to start getting that economic engine do the work rather than, than the government. And, and I would um, encourage us to get open, open as safely and open as quickly and vigorously as possible. Yes, definitely. I, I would agree. So um, that's good news to know. Um, I do think that, you know, like I said, in traveling around, everyone seems like to be headed in that direction. So I can only hope that we are, can, will continue to move forward, just like you said. Let's talk about Irvine Lake. So how is Irvine Lake um, doing with the opening of the shore fishing opportunities? Irvine Lake has been great. I um, um, love chatting about it in part because, you know, early on, it was, to my mind, a good example of, you know, responding to the community. We, we heard, I heard when I got into office and, and folks in my office, we were hearing um, questions like, well, why is Irvine Lake closed? And, you know, I taught my granddaughter, my, my grandfather taught me to fish here. I want to teach my granddaughter to fish there. And so, what we were able to do in my office was get together several of the um, government and business entities that that had a stake in Irvine Lake. Um, it was two water districts, the Irvine Ranch Water District, the Toronto Water District County, and the Irvine Company. And we were able to finally hammer out a deal that got it open again. And the response from the public was very gratifying. It was very overwhelming. It was awesome. And what we are looking at um, now is that original deal from a little more than a year ago is, is, is wrapping up. We're trying to get a long-term deal in place. That is proving to be a bit of a challenge, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll get it done. And I now like to use uh, Irvine Lake in part because, look, we just, we just came through a contentious election. Everybody knows it. 
politics has become much, much more of a blood sport than it was when I first got involved years ago. And what I like to do is point to Irvine Lake and say, hey, this is an example of how you do public service the right way. Not me, but, right. but the county government, several governments came together, private enterprise came together. The need was clear. Everybody looked at ways of solving the problem. And then once we had a deal, I had to go back and get um, the votes from my colleagues on the board of supervisors to go spend money in my district. But, you know, it turned out that the public issue there and the public opportunity, and, uh, the, the opportunity to serve the public was so compelling that I now like to point to Irvine Lake and say, that's the way government can, in fact, continue to do business, put aside, that wasn't partisan, but it was significant um, fiscal issues and reach a consensus for the public. And so I'm happy to report Irvine Lake remains open. Fishing is available. We stock the lake periodically. Um, I'm still trying to get boats out there. That's complicated. We're looking for a long-term deal. It's complicated. I'm optimistic we're gonna get it done. Well, thank you for your work on having Irvine Lake open. So Irvine Lake, our beaches are very important to our county. And I think that especially with, you know, there being a general consensus that there's more stress <laughs> among everybody lately, having a lake and having those beaches open is definitely helpful. I know, I, I see the photos of people fishing on Instagram and it just seems like a very relaxing space that people can go and kind of get away from that desk, you know, time. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. As well, I wanted to ask you about um, staying connected. So I have seen that you've hosted quite a few virtual town halls. So tell me how you, aside from the virtual town halls and along with those, how have you stayed in touch with your constituents during this time? Well, the, the secret is on this call with us, Pat Buttress. Pat, Pat. <laughs> who doesn't and you know the the answer is that that you can stay connected if you try and I have asked staff and it's in fact I love my staff they are very interested in making sure that they're connected to the community you know Pat Pat didn't get her start in government or in public service with me you know she's been there forever in the communities not forever but you know what I mean, Pat, sorry. And, and they're just, those opportunities are out there. People are continuing to do things for themselves, for their communities, for each other, that um, if you want to stay connected, if, if you tap into somebody like, like Pat or Altello, who you all know, I'm sure, mm -hmm. or several of, of the other folks that work for me in my, in my office, we find the opportunities, they find and direct to me the opportunities to say, hey, let's go do a Zoom with these folks. Let's go talk to these folks. Here's somebody doing some good in the community. Let's give them a, a, a certificate. The, um, the Assistance League just celebrated its, I, I want to say, 80th anniversary. Oh, wow. And, and so it's like, you know, normally it would have been a big deal and there would have been a lot of, you know, a, a, a big event. And it ended up me and a couple of the, the wonderful volunteers and, and leadership of the Assistance League, but getting out with a recognition, a proclamation, that sort of thing. Um, it is tougher in the time of COVID to, to stay connected, but um, people want it. People are itching for connection. Those opportunities out there, I depend on community pillars like Pat to point me in those directions. And, uh, and you, you just, you, it takes, it takes some, some walking around and willingness to drive around, but uh, that's part of the job. And by the way, it's also a lot better. I, I got, I, I got to add that, that, <laughs> and I've said this, and you guys maybe have heard this before. And I, I, I don't know if it sounds like pandering. I never mean it to, because it truly isn't. But I have always said the best part of this job is actually getting out into the community. The worst part of COVID is the, the lack of, some of the ex uh, opportunities to get out into the community as much as before. And, you know, it, it's not the stuff that comes out of the city hall or comes out of the hall of administration. It's that, that makes this community so wonderful. It's the folks in their communities doing for themselves that, uh, that I get to 
you know, parachute in and say, hey, thank you for 80 great years. You guys are awesome, for example, with Assistance League. Anyway, there you go. Oh, I have to say that I truly appreciate Pat and also Al. I know that um, you know, Pat's on our executive board. So of course, like, you know, she's near and dear to us. But um, both, I have seen both of them out and about, you know, and because I do speak to Pat regularly and they've also spoken to Al a couple of times, um, I've seen them, you know, reaching out to people via Zoom, making those phone calls, you know, at socially distant um, openings and things like that. Like they're definitely out there and I think a good representation of your office. So thank you. I have my, um, my Wagner mug here on my desk <laughs> for when they stop by the chapel. So I have, we appreciate that. Like you said, with COVID um, happening and people not being able to meet as much in person, you do feel that impact of just not having that personal communication. So I believe that they've done an amazing job of just getting out there on your behalf. So Oh, I know. Oh, I recognize so it. I agree. <laughs> thank you very, so much. Very lucky to have them. Let me ask you about this. Now, some of the counties or some of the cities in Orange, um, their districts have done things a little bit differently. You've chosen to let um, the cities here in the third district do their own allocations. I guess, how did you come to that decision and like, how has that been working? Well, so, so, the, so the back story is the county had available to it money through, this was CARES Act funding that was supposed to go to small businesses to help small businesses through COVID. And each district was allocated money. The decision that I made, and uh, it was uh, myself and Supervisor Steele, now Congresswoman Steele, we, had, we, we decided, I think, separately, but did it this way. And the other guys did it differently. But bottom line was this. Um, each of the cities in my district had themselves recognized that businesses were struggling and they were doing their own small business outreach, small business grants. And what I thought made, frankly, the most sense to me as somebody who respects my cities, respects the councils that are, th that, that, that are there, mm -hmm. knew they had these programs already in place rather than me reinvent the wheel, rather than me pick and choose out of each of my cities who would get money. I just basically allocated the money, not basically, allocated the money um, by population, weighted in my district and gave it to each of the cities and said, you're already doing this. You know your business is better than I do at the county level. And so here, continue helping mm -hmm. and do it on behalf of not just you, but, but the county to the extent we can be a small part of, of the solution. So we, we, we kicked around options, opportunities. It was gonna, we were gonna have to cut like a million dollars off the top for an administrator. And it was just, I, no, too much new government, too much wasted spending. I gave it to, to my cities on a per capita basis and said, let me help with the great work you're already doing. And we appreciate that. I feel like, you know, especially you do have quite a few cities and um, each one knows its constituents really well. So I think that's an, that was a great decision. So thank you. Each of them, yeah, each of them made different calls, um, mm -hmm. different requirements, you know, of, of how long you've been in operation or how many employees or what. And it's like, you, you know, Mark Murphy knows what works for Orange a whole lot better than Don Wagner does. And in, you know, your Belinda, the, the mayor there, Peggy Huang, or it was Beth Haney at the time, certainly knows your Belinda better than Don Wagner. Hey, you guys are doing great work. Let me help. Well, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to take this in a completely different direction. Uh -oh. Let's talk ruins. Oh, my goodness. How much time have you got? Are, well, not that long. Uh -oh. Are you? So I'm guessing I was going to ask you: Are you a big Bruins fan? Yeah, I see. I know that you're a UCLA alumnus. So I, I am. Okay, so I am. My wife is. My daughter. My oldest daughter is. Um, my youngest daughter got in, and was too scared to tell us she wasn't going to go. She chose Georgia Tech ultimately, and we found out on Facebook. Oh, no. So we are a longtime <laughs> Bruin family. It has been a tough, tough football couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, big, uh, big Bruin fan. I actually, you know, of course I follow the Bruin football, but then the gymnastics, I love. It's just my favorite pastime when it's on, when it's gymnastics season. 
It, it is, they are, they are absolutely awesome. And of course they've got, they've got um, one routine or, or maybe it's now two routines that have gone viral. Mm-hmm. And yes. it's just, it's so much fun to watch. There's so much passion, so much excitement um, um, in, in college sports. It's great fun. When I was in the legislature, the, um, the Bruins won two national championships, one in baseball and one in uh, um, uh, volleyball. And okay. I had an opportunity. And I had an opportunity to host the, um, the teams up in Sacramento state legislature, you know, when you win a national championship, everybody tries to, to glom onto it and, and just meeting some of these athletes and seeing the, just the, the passion with which they <laughs> attack their sports, which is true of any school, not just Bruins, but, uh, but I did have the opportunity and, and the yeah, Abercan, I'm watching that, uh, those, those gymnastic routines, gosh, they're infectious. They're just, yeah, they're amazing. It's, it's definitely the highlight of my weekend when they're on. So that was actually one of the things I thought I would do this year as I kind of got into it like last year, late in the season. And I thought, oh, you know, next year I'll be able to watch it in person. But, you know, I'll wait one more year <laughs> and then head over there and watch those in person. <laughs> it was the soccer team. It was the women's soccer team. It wasn't the volleyball team. Okay, but, soccer. But anyway, yeah. So anyway, wanted to make sure I got that record. Yeah, they're just, they're good at everything. It's, so It's, it's loads of fun. <laughs> You, you, yeah, college, college sports, the, the energy there is just so much fun. One more question. And I know I, I asked this of our last guest and it, I, we learned something interesting. So um, what do you do to, have you, what have you been doing to relax? I mean, there's so much uptime. What are you doing in your downtime? Anything different this, this time of year or? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It, it sort of dovetails with the last one because to be honest, um, I don't have many hobbies. Um, I, I, you know, work has always been somewhat consuming. The, the, the hobby that my wife and I have, and, and, and guys, you'll know I married up, is, is sports. Um, she is also, my wife is also a very big Bruin fan. Okay. Season tickets to football. We try to get up for both basketball and baseball games periodically. We do get to the women, try to get up to the women's soccer games periodically. Um, and so with COVID and at least the first several months, the, the closing down of sports, um, you know, we, we binge watched, finally got the Game of Thrones, binge watched something else. Um, the Kaminsky method, I don't know if you guys have, okay. have seen that. Okay, I've heard of that. Anyway, so, so there's that. And then, and maybe, I don't know, nobody's probably noticed that my, I'm drinking from a cup that says world's best grandpa. So my, my, my granddaughter is about uh, 15 months old. Okay. So that, that has been the thing that has kept me the busiest away from work and, and uh, is, is absolutely great. I don't yet consider myself a best grandpa. That is a work in progress, but uh, I'm aiming, <laughs> I'm aiming to do that record. Okay. That is awesome. I'm sure to her, you are the world's best grandpa. That's congratulations. <laughs> That's fun. That's loads of fun. That is fun. Okay. Let's go back to something more, uh, more serious. Um, okay. Public safety. Um, I know that's a top priority of yours. Can you share some of the highlights of your work you've done as supervisor? We know that you've done um, something with the uh, our items as far as like the sober living home restrictions. You've worked on that. Um, the rate kit, kit backlogs. You've worked on that. Like let's, what about those? Let's talk about some of those. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because, you know, when I, when I ran back in, in 2019 in the special, and then again for re-election in early 2020, it was pre-COVID. Okay. And there were lots of things everybody was talking about, but, but a lot of them sort of boiled down to either homelessness or public safety, public safety being um, a, a, the uptick in, in property crimes that was happening, the um, um, increase in crimes related to the homelessness, the sober living homes that you touched on, and, and some of the problems we were having with that. We ended up trying to address a number of those through this office. Um, fire safety is, is a component of public safety. When you talk public safety, often you think crime, but Certainly fire safety is a component of that. And so we launched several initiatives to try to, to make some improvements on those fronts. Now, COVID hits, it pushes all of those issues to the back of people's minds. 
COVID monopolizes everybody's time and energy, but it didn't solve homelessness. It didn't solve crime. It didn't stop wildfires. Um, those issues remain out there. And so we tried to, while dealing with COVID and come up with a coherent government response to COVID that minimizes the, the pain of the lockdowns, et cetera, and keeps us safe, we were still dealing with um, some of those crime issues. For example, you mentioned the rape kit backlog. This predates me. Todd Spitzer, when he was third district supervisor, was working on clearing any as much as 30 year backlog oh my goodness. In, in these rape kits. And, okay. and, and he goes off to the DA's office. I take this office. Um, he and I started working together to keep that going. And we ended up coming up with, with some funding that was able to whittle down that backlog. And I wanna say we got something like a hundred hits off of those as much as 30 year old kits. That's not a hundred people went to jail, not, but, but you're providing closure to victims. Um, in a couple of cases, you did bring predators off the streets. Um, but, but basically I found it a, a, an opportunity to get, get us to the point where we are assuring the public when these crimes happen, we are taking them seriously. We are gonna be diligent in, in working to solve them and providing the types of closure that, that the victims need. We came up with a sober living home ordinance that tightened up the rules so okay. that individuals who want help and need help can get help. But though there were, and there were predatory sober living homes that were taking people in, taking their money, insurance runs out, they're kicking them out, they weren't providing the help. But those bad actors are, are there are now more tools to crack down on them. So those who need the help are getting the help and are good neighbors. Those who don't need or want help aren't willing to take help are abusing insurance, those we crack down on. Um, we did a couple of fire safety town halls so that folks in communities that are susceptible to fires um, uh, did one in Orange and uh, have done them throughout the district. Folks are told and have, have more readily available information Here's how you protect yourselves. Um, make sure you know the way in, the way out during a, a, um, an evacuation. Right. Make sure that um, you take the steps you can around your own home to not fireproof it, but to give yourself a better chance in the event of a wildfire. Um, I serve on the Orange County Transportation Authority where your good mayor is the vice chairman. He was instrumental in helping get this done, but um, you know, wildfires, they, they, I will say often, but they are, we, we know them to be sparked by weeds abutting a freeway. So we work with OCTA and the transportation corridor agencies to have buffers so that, you know, a car overheats, car throws a spark, hitting a rock, et cetera. You're not suddenly looking at a disastrous wildfire. Those are the kinds of things that we have been involved in because though COVID has monopolized everybody's attention, these other problems haven't gone away. That's an important um, aspect of what's going on actually is just to kind of note that that is what's happening is that you have other items that are still continuing to happen. Your office and our great office of um, the mayor are working on things that just kind of a business as usual, like business as usual is still happening. We yeah. also have COVID. And so we appreciate your widespread <laughs> um, help on all of those for sure. So thank you. We, we, we try and to the extent anyone's got issues or things that we need to know about. Right. You guys know how to find me and you know how to find Pat. Yes. Yes, we do. I have a question that came in from Facebook, it looks like. Um, it says, how are we doing on National Veterans Cemetery in Orange County? I've seen some recent activity in Irvine. Okay. So that is, a, again, a moving target. Okay. There is a, there is a bill in the state legislature right now. Uh, Senator Umberg is carrying it that specifies there should be money for an Orange County Veterans Cemetery. It does not say the site. Irvine has uh, two sites. I am of the belief that one of them, the golf course site, is perhaps no longer under consideration. Um, whether that's for political reasons or other reasons, I don't know. Um, 
but but I am told that site has fallen off. So there remains a site in Irvine that to my mind is probably not doable. Not doable because of the expense. Um, you're looking at about last I heard, and this was three-ish years ago, you're looking at, at $96 million just for remediation before you get any bodies in the ground. The good news is there is a site in Anaheim Hills off the 241 and the 91 um, that is zoned for a cemetery. The city of Anaheim is supportive of a veterans component there. The county has deeded the land to the cemetery district with the caveat that they will put a veterans cemetery there, finance dependent. And so it's been my sense that that's probably the better place for it because you don't have the expense of the $96 million. You don't have the political fight that you have in Irvine. Several of the veterans groups are supportive of it now. And you know, the city council is supportive of it. So it's my hope that we'll be able to get the cemetery steered from Irvine, where I am not confident they will ever get it done, to the Anaheim Hills site. The um, um, caveat always is money, getting the state to at least agree to look at that site remains the, the challenge. I'm hopeful that we can get that done sooner rather than later. And for veterans that are on the call, one of the issues that I very, very much resonate to is that the, the Irvine location was thought ideal because of course it was within the footprint of El Toro. And for so many years that had such a connection that land to our veterans um, as, as one of the prime advocates for a veteran cemetery told me that is the last part of US soil many veterans ever stood on. And that's why it's, it's a great location, but cost and politics getting in the way, what I'd like to do is move us out to the Anaheim Hills location and make the El Toro connection. You have to, inevitably, we're going to be demolishing runways and buildings on the El Toro footprint. Mm -hmm. You know that that material gets recycled. Let's recycle it and bring El Toro to Anaheim Hills and use that for the infrastructure and for some of the monuments. And if you can't put the cemetery on El Toro, you can bring El Toro to the vets. Okay, well, thank you for that update. We appreciate that. We uh -huh. are near the end. We're almost at the 10 o'clock hour. Um, any final thoughts or a message for our business community? Well, uh, yes, hang in there. Okay. We do believe that, I do believe that opening is coming sooner rather than later. We are very supportive at the county level of you opening and opening safely. The um, county has for months had in place guidelines that specify if you do these things, and it's basically follow the safe opening guidelines that almost every individual industry has, rather than rewrite them ourselves, we said, look to your industries, open safely, mask, distance, et cetera. We will, at the county, we will not hassle you. And we will not send the healthcare agency out to shut you down. We will not send the sheriff out to enforce. Individual cities have their own rights to do things differently. But what I would say is if you're a business, you're thinking about opening and um, a city that you're in doesn't prohibit it, then let's look for ways to open safely. I believe it can be done and the county will support your efforts to do it. Well, thank you so much. I do have one last ask from you. So we, I don't know if you know this, we are going to be turning the chamber, the Orange Chamber of Commerce will be turning 100 this July in 2021. So we're hoping to be able to celebrate. And so if we are able to do so, we would love for you to join us. You don't have to commit now, but however that might be, we'd like for you to be there. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine missing it. That sounds okay, awesome. good. <laughs> thank years. you. 
Well, Don, it has been a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate your time. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I would like to thank a couple of our sponsors. If you guys will bear with me for one moment while I pull up a screen here. Let's see. We've got, oops, wrong screen. So I would love to thank our Chairman Circle sponsors. If you guys can just look to see, we've got many of you throughout the community who help put, make the chamber what it is and we appreciate you and we thank you. I also want to give a quick announcement. So we are going to on exactly one month from today. So that's March 24th, which is a Wednesday at 6 p.m. We're going to host Mayor Mark Murphy and an evening update. So we're going to be sharing some news about our wonderful city of Orange. And so Mark Murphy has graciously agreed to join us and we're going to host that as an evening time. So make sure you guys put that in your calendars, March 24th, 6 p.m. And we'll be here as well. We also have our BNG, our business network networking group that meets once monthly on the third Wednesday. So on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, we'll be meeting at noon, and that is going to be on Zoom. You can find all of that on our Facebook. We're also available at orangechamber.com. I believe Don can be reached at ocgov.com. Am I correct, Don? Donald.wagner at ocgov.com or 714-834-3330. So Perfect. throw a lot of threes in there because it's the third district. I love that. Well, thank you guys so much. And with that, we will see you in a month. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Have a great day and have a great week. Thank you all. Bye-bye.